have a plan coordinated. It's just, it's, we used to do a thousand parks. By the time you visit all your family. Good morning, family folks. We're going to come. We've got a special program for you this morning with uh, Tim Take Wood of uh, Wood Saddle here in Kingman, Arizona. This is going to be really a lot of fun today. And then uh, Steve Lasseur is here trying out some new equipment. Uh, Steve's with My Marketing Designs, and he's always bringing uh, new and exciting things together for his clients, the latest technologies. Mr. Tim, how are you doing this morning? Doing very well, Mr. Tim. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine and dandy. I'm upright. See what kind of fun we can have today, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for doing this this morning. No problem. No problem. We've been meaning to talk. You piqued my interest when you mentioned you'd been doing this as a family business for quite a few years. 165 years since my great grandfather. All Texas, or all Texas till now. Till now. And so you're kind of an immigrant. Oh yeah. This is my. This is just my fifth year here in Kingman. That's good. What are we working on this morning? What did I catch you in the middle of? Well, this is going to be something uh, sort of challenging, Mr. Greg Arnold. And we're going to take a couple pieces of leather like this, and we're going to tool it up more of a geometrical pattern. We're going to go down to the cobalt mine and get some turquoise to mount in the center. We'll put one on each side and suspend it by some sort of probably a monofilament and let him build a metal structure to hold it so it's sort of a modification of a dream catcher. And we'll tool on it here in a little bit for you. So you've got kind of a colorful background. When I first met you, you were working with uh, Patriot Rail. Yes, I was general manager of the Kingman Terminal Railroad when I moved, we moved here in 2012. Um, and we started the railroad out at the airport. It, we had nothing but tracks, no locomotives, no customers, no nothing. And within three years, we were running 200 rail cars a month out of the airport. That's incredible. Uh, that, uh, that's, that industrial park out there has just awesome potential. Well, it's awesome potential. It's doing awesome things now. There's a lot of companies people don't realize that are, uh, you take JM Eagle, they're the biggest pipe producer in the southwest right out there and they're just turning out pipe they've got machinery they can make pipe that's up to 72 inches in diameter i mean it's it's and they use a lot of the plastic they were one of my biggest customers the fun thing is, is i've had a very charmed life my whole life has been doing ranching i actually cowboyed i was managed a cattle ranch for 22 years in texas and then when the gentleman i worked for had the audacity to die i couldn't work for his sons so I started railroading, started out as a brakeman, became a conductor, an engineer, and then a general manager. So I've got to do what every little boy wants to do. I've cowboyed my entire life. I've also been a railroad engineer driving locomotives. So that is the ultimate cool. I am truly blessed. That's a good life. <laughs> and we were talking earlier about bull riding. You know, that's yes. that's God's way of eliminating stupid people. And, you are correct. And you you, you even did you survived that one. Yes, uh, sir. I, I I rodeo from time little bridges, mutt and busting when I was a little kid, all the way up um, high school rodeo, college rodeo, um, a little uh, the professional rodeo. I just wasn't as good as I thought it was. But like I was telling you, the uh, reason I did, I rode saddle bronc and bareback bronc and did a little roping. But first time a very, very pretty girl in high school asked me if I rode bulls, I'm like, I do now. <laughs> 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 Had to borrow $50 in a bull rigging to go ride a bull. But that's pretty much why any boy climbs up on a 3,000 pound bull. I uh, I did, I was never you know, real good at this because uh, I wasn't raised around it, but uh, I had a John Wayne period, and I worked uh, ranches down in New Mexico and some here in Arizona. And I tried my hand at saddle bronc for a while, but uh, I could never drink enough to do bull riding. That <laughs> That's was pretty it. much it. It's a, uh, it is a, it's an extreme sport. There's no doubt. And the kids now, of course, bulls are different than they were back then too. They were specially bred, bred just for bucking. Um, you know, it's, and the kids are just way more athletic than we were back here. I mean, on all the rough stock. And there's just no way I'd even try to compete now. Uh, you know, it's just that tough. And they're very, very good. Very good. 
Well, rodeo itself is a is a different kind of sport, and it's changed a lot too. Mm -hmm. It's 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 not just a working cowboy sport anymore, like the days with Chris Ledoux and some of the boys. Oh, yeah. But uh, I, I I it's amazing some of the lifestyle. I was when I was doing this, I went to a Fourth uh, of July, and they had an old timers rodeo in Enid, Oklahoma. And they weren't doing the tough stuff. They weren't doing the bronc riding, the bull riding, but they were doing, uh, you know, the rest of the sports, the cast, steer wrestling and mm -hmm. uh, roping. And the only qualification was 60 or older. Yep. And these, some of these boys out there were 80 years old. Still and roping. And bent up like a pretzel talking about how good the life had been to them. It is. It's a fun life. It is. You're in the wide open. You're always outside. It is uh, a lifestyle that a lot of people don't understand anymore. Um, I've seen men buy a half a million dollars worth of cattle on handshake, and they damn sure delivered. Um, it was, it, and growing up, my father owned livestock auctions, and so I dealt with cattlemen all over the state of Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, and that was the way it is. It was just, you didn't need bankers, you sure to hell didn't need lawyers, and you know, you just lived up to your word, and it, it's it's a great way to live. It really, really is. Yeah, as an old boy told me, it's a good living if you don't plan on living long. That's it. Yes, and and, and it's, it's not for the meek. It, you're going to work. It is constant work. No vacations, no nothing like that. The worst ones are dairy farmers. They never take a day off. They can't. And, you know, you got to love it. And that's the thing. You love the land. You love the lifestyle. You love everything about it. And that's just part. That's it. I mean, it is a lifestyle. Well, how after all those years in Texas, how did you end up in Kangman? Well, like I said, came out here to build the railroad. Um, we built it and things, and then I actually became a regional general manager. I had a railroad in Sacramento, California, and then ran the one here in Kingman as well. Uh, did a little early retirement and. My wife and I talked about going back to Texas and coming to Kingman. We felt there was a lot more opportunity um, and growth potential here in Kingman. So we came back to Kingman and uh, we actually were in our RV. We had all five of us in our RV until we found what we wanted. We had plenty of time and we opened up a saddle shop. I made a deal with a gentleman that owns this building and it, uh, just opened up, had one saddle, I actually used to have a couch over there so people could sit and visit. And um, just started growing and it's been very, very well. We've, we've got all the saddles in here you see um, are for sale up front here. Um, and we've been selling some saddles. I actually sold a saddle to a couple out of Queensland, Australia. And we'll be shipping that saddle here pretty quick. Ranching, you know, is kind of a, uh, it's, it's become like a lot of small family farms. It's kind of died out, but uh, to what it was, you know, years ago. But a lot of people don't realize how many people own horses in this oh. country. When I was doing the due diligence for this saddle shop, Kingman, Golden Valley, uh, Havasu, Bullhead City, all the surrounding, and there's over 20,000 head of horses in this part of the county. And that's not counting far south county or far east county. There is a lot of horses. People love the Western lifestyle. Um, you can't hardly go on any trails in Golden Valley or north of Kingman or anything like that without seeing people on horseback. They're buying their places of two, four, five, ten acres. They're building their stalls. They're getting their horses. It's just an absolute lifestyle. The difference between motorized sports, of course, when you're out riding on a horse and you're looking at all the amazing land that's around here, it's totally quiet. The only thing you hear is that horse breathing and the steps on the rock. That's it. I mean, there isn't much between you and the Lord when you're out there riding. I've always enjoyed doing that. That's uh, something about being out. Absolutely. Open, breathing, free. And there's nothing like the feeling of being on a good horse. Nothing. It just, it, it just makes you feel alive. It really, really does. You mentioned, uh, you know, your family, 165 years doing this. My wife's family, uh, I'm kind of new to this. I'm originally from back east. We moved out here in the summer of 66. And, uh, but my wife's family, every time, now the kids, the younger generation, the under 50 crowd, they've scattered to the cities and done things. And, but, uh, boy, I tell you, when we first got married, it was like a John Wayne film festival. They, 
her, or my uh, father-in-law was actually born in Tombstone. Oh, wow. And his uh, grandfather was the sheriff out of Cochise County down there. And uh, hey, she's he's got some good stories. Six, uh, six, seven generations Arizona mm -hmm. family. So, well, the, you know, thing about Arizona, just like Texas, everybody came from someplace else. You know, that's that's part of the huge migration from east to west. Um, my family, like I said, you said, has been has been in the saddle bit harness business for 165 years. This saddle right here, my grandfather made in 1905, right there in Gainesville. Um, and my great grandfather, he, uh, they lived in what was then called the territories, Indian territories, which is Oklahoma. And the cholera broke out real bad, and they put my great grandfather and his sister on a horse, and they swam the Red River into Gainesville. And the sheriff of Cook County raised them. And my great grandfather went to work for Mr. Cheney, right there in Gainesville. And the Cheney family, of course, married one of the daughters, so we became kin. And Bruce Cheney there in Gainesville still has a saddle shop, and his son and son-in-law are working the saddle shop in Gainesville. Um, you know, you leave it for a little bit, but even when I was ranching, I had a saddle shop right there at the ranch, and you just keep on doing it. Like I said, that my grandfather made that saddle. That saddle right there, I actually I made it, but it was finished. When my father died, he had it on the shop floor, so... I finished it up for him, finished up so it's like a father-son project. I fixed a few of his mistakes as any good son should do. Um, and that's the saddle I ride. Made it a little fancy, but eh, well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you mentioned something, you know, now even your saddle there, you know, it's a little bit classier. And it, it, people don't think it, uh, that this used to be transportation. Absolutely. Well, you look at different saddles. This saddle right here, I just got through restoring from a uh, gentleman here in town. And that's about the 1890s. All right, when in Arizona, and we have no idea who made it. it was, it's an extraordinarily good saddle. But you look how saddles evolve. The higher back, this is the camel. And the higher the back gives you more back support for being in the saddle all day. So you're more comfortable. You sit in the saddle instead of on it. Another thing people don't realize, when you're working cattle and you rope and you're dragging to a branding iron and stuff like that, they don't lead like dogs do on a leash. They're jumping up and down, bouncing around and stuff. And this higher cannel hooks your ropes tied on your horn. And so that higher cannel keeps the rope from slapping you on the leg, which will leave a huge bruise and it hurts like fire. And so that's another reason for the higher cannel. After World War II, Bunch of the Western soldiers came back from war and they were broke as church mouses. So the fastest way for them to make any quick cash was to go to rodeos. Well, you're doing timed events where you got to get out of your saddle. Well, the higher cannel makes it harder to get out of your saddle faster. So they started lowering cannels. You can see on my saddle how it's lowered. This is a three inch cannel where this is a six inch cannel. That way you could get out of your saddle faster to go rope the calf and tie the calves or jump off and dog the steers and things like that. And of course, just like anything where entertainment's involved, people see a championship cowboy riding a certain saddle and they want that saddle like that rather than the old style saddle. Just like, you know, um, a skier comes up there and he's got these certain kind of skis and he wins a gold medal in Olympics. Well, everybody wants that certain kind of skis. Of course, that's where you start really making your money. <laughs> you say your grandfather built this one in 05, huh? Yes, in 1905. Something else a lot of people don't realize, people were smaller back then than they are now. And this is an adult man's saddle. Because back in those days, women didn't ride a straddle because that was unladylike. They rode side saddle. And excellent horsemen when they were on side saddle too, and that's pretty hard to do. But... This was a normal, the average size of a man back then was about five, six, 135 pounds. So they were smaller saddles. Of course, the horses have changed a lot. If you look at the, how wide it is in between here, horses are more raw boned, smaller, and things like that. And so this really wouldn't fit today's horses because they've gotten bigger. We feed them better. Um, so it's hard to put this saddle on a horse like that. You look at the difference, like in mine, in the width, because the horse's withers are so much wider. There's actually quite a science to it. The tree of a saddle is designed, this is what's in every western saddle like this. 
It's a it's pieces of wood that are mortised and tended together. Then they take and cover it with rawhide, which is untanned hide. That when it's wet. You put it on there, and as it shrinks, it forms to that wood perfectly, and it becomes almost indestructible. I mean, these things, you can run over them with trucks and things like that, and they won't break if they're well made. But what it does, you can see where this fits over the front of the withers of the horse. It's behind their shoulder blades, so it does not interfere with their shoulder blades, but it also spreads out the weight of the person and all of the things on their back, too. So you've got evenly distributed weight all over the back of the horse and that makes the horse capable of carrying more weight comfortably. And it is a science. That is, uh, you figure pound for pound because remember, when people traveled, everything they owned was on that saddle. From their weapons to their clothes to their food that they were carrying, everything is on and it had to be distributed. And, and General McNally, who designed the McClellan, McClellan, who designed the military saddle, knew before the Civil War that there was going to be a Western expansion and knew also the English-style saddles that they were riding could not support the weight of all day, every day, riding in the Western, Western lands. And so he designed the tree that's basic, same basic tree that's in them today. And that way, so also, English saddles, most of them, you need a little help get on. Well, if you're in a battle situation, you can't wait for Jim to help me get in my saddle and then I ride beside him, grab his hand, and yank him up in the saddle because then you're dead. So you had to be able to get on your saddle quickly. And so with this tree set up and the rigging set up, they was, it was secure on the horse. That way you could get on your saddle by yourself in a hurry. What's the oldest saddle you've got here? The oldest saddle I've got here probably is that saddle in the 1890s right now. I uh, did have one a little bit older um, that I restored and the customer came and picked up. The thing about people don't realize on the restoration saddle, you don't want to replace any leather. You want it exactly original and you don't want to replace the lining and things like that because the collectors want it original. This saddle here actually has the original braided horsehair girth to go along with it. Jeez. And so, you know, that's, that's pretty cool there. That girt like that to have it made today would probably cost about $600. This is quite amazing. You know, you, you never think about saddle collectors. Oh, yeah, that's huge. Yeah. Huge, yeah. huge, huge. The, and the museum here in town has an excellent saddles, uh, some amazing saddles down in the basement. I'm working with Shannon. We're going to start restoring some. Uh, I did have the honor of restoring Andy Devine's silver saddle, which is a very, very cool saddle. It, besides all the silver, 23 pounds of in fully engraved sterling silver, um, the Kellogg's company had it made for Andy when he was doing the television program. Uh, I just went totally blank. The Wild Bill Hickok. Wild, Wild Bill Hickok show. And back then it was made in about, I think, 53 55 yeah, right around there that saddle cost twelve thousand dollars back then right right now it's insured for about three hundred and ninety thousand okay um the gentleman that made that saddle and that's the beauty part about the saddle there's always a backstory the gentleman that made that saddle ran away from home when he was 13 years old from sweden Caught a boat, came in New York City, and there was a railroad bit Burke and Northern actually to have the Norwegian, Swedes, and things to get them in the Minnesota area, Montana, and things like that. Had special passage on rail. So he ran away, ran away to Montana to become a cowboy. That's what he wanted to do. Well, he becomes an exceptional roper, trick roper. I mean, he was just considered the best in the state. And he was, of course, an amazing artist, and he got to building saddles, and he opened up his first saddle company, a shop in Miles City. And you got to think, this is a 16, 17-year-old kid, and he's out there in the middle of the street doing rope tricks to bring people into a saddle shop. Well, he hears about a place in California called Hollywood, and they're making moving picture shows. And he goes down there, and he makes him a custom vest, custom boots and a custom, they called them grips back in, suitcase. And he goes down there and ropes. He doesn't make it in the movies. Well, 
He goes down there ropes while he's fixing to go back to Miles City, and he's standing at the railroad depot, <coughs> and Tom Mix drives up and buys his boots, vest, and his grip from him. So he's standing there with the paper sack and his stocking feet, fixing to head back home. Tom Mix comes around and says, listen, most kind of movies we're making right now is westerns. He said, and I have a hard enough time keeping these stooges from falling out of their saddle, horses. He said, and there is no tack whatsoever, no saddle, none. So they opened up a saddle shop in, in Hollywood, California, which is still open today, and started building saddles. And then, of course, his silversmithing came out. He actually made nine sterling silver ta uh, telephones for uh, Mae West, for her and he did all of Roy Rogers' saddles, Dale Evans' saddles. He did Clayton Moore, who was the Lone Ranger, did his saddles. He did Clayton Moore's car, which had a silver saddle in the center and gun belts on the back. He did John Wayne's gun belts, everything else of John Wayne's stuff. And he died at 102 in his saddle shop in Hollywood, California. So there's always a backstory somewhere that's absolutely cool. They said that he looked like a cowboy. He rode like a cowboy. He roped better than most cowboys, but when he opened his mouth, he knew he was a Swede. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the West back then. People came from everywhere. That's what makes it so cool. I know it's your workbench here. Yes. You know, God bless us. At, uh, like your oak toolbox there. That's, that's, uh, that was my father-in-law. He was a master machinist, and this is a Gershner. Um, one of the best toolboxes was, and when he passed, he gave it, well, he gave it to me before he passed. Um, he was quite a fella himself. Then that one's just a nice little wood chest I picked up. But the round knife, which you use to cut your leather, uh, that was my dad's. And then a saddler's hammer, like this one right here, this was my grandfather's. And that's what you can reach in and be the pull tacks, or you can reach in to do your nails in hard to reach places and things like that. Then to smooth leather or to thin it down a little bit, you have what's called a French shoe hammer. And it's got a perfectly smooth head on it. And, things. and then you get different hammers. This mallet here was actually made by the gentleman that made that little Christmas tree in the window. He did this out of um, cat claw. And it's a good little mallet to do stuff. It's got a perfect weight to it and things like that. And it was made right here in Kingdom. Do you still have, do you use the same seal that uh, you're? No, what I use, let's see if I got something with it on. <laughs> uh, I had nothing. I keep the same type of deal. And you get it made. It's a little brass plate that you stamp with. Yeah. And I, you don't want to do exactly the same. Of course, my name is William Lattimore, but you know, you keep everyone. My dad's had the same star. It's always had the same star. And one thing about Texas and Arizona, those are the only two state flags where the star is the center of the flags. Texas has a long star. Arizona's got a copper star. So it's actually pretty cool and it works out really well. But this one right here, we're going to do this for Mr. Greg Arnold. See if we got a little project we're going to think about. And what I'm doing, you have to do what's called casing the leather. I got to put my eyeballs on. And that is you mix a certain kind of soap with water and you put it on the leather and that loosens the fiber to where you can do your tooling. We're going to do some just a geometrical stamp. The first thing we're going to do is take what's called a swivel knife. And you can see we made these little lines right here. What we're going to do in the center is we're going to put like a, a concho. This is not the one. Or what I'm going to do is go down to Cobalt's Mine and get a piece of turquoise to go in the center like that. But in order to make it a little bit more fun, we'll take him. And see, this knife is set up on ball bearings to where you can turn the blade. Everything I make is completely hand tooled. I cannot make anything the same. A bit more just. Okay. 
it's really good to see uh, craftsmen still work. I always admire that. I it's just it's a skill set I've never had. I can uh, I can use duct tape pretty proficiently and hey, look, bailing don't, wire. Don't cut tape, man. <laughs> no, I'm pretty handy with it. I can keep things on going with duct tape and wire, but crafting things is uh. Well, this is something too that, like I said, my family's been doing this for 165 years. Um, I'm fourth generation, and my 14 year old son is learning it too. He's already built a couple of holsters for people that. Um, were for customers and he builds knife sheaths and things like that. But you take something like this. This is just a simple little tool. And then we'll take and do a like I said, don't measure really because we want that to be unique. We don't want it to be made in China stamped in one giant stamp. We want it to be totally unique. Like I said, this is gonna be a geometric design. And the reason you case your leather is because this will a little closer and that makes it a little bit more fun. And then you've got a nice little design like that. Now we'll take and do a it's called it's this is a tool if you've ever seen basket weave and I'll show you something with basket weave on it this is basket weave mm. oh very nice yes all right and what you that's just one way you can do it but you can turn the same tool I guess go all the way around and it just adds another little geometric and then you go all the way around doing that and then you'll do some other frills and dressings on there. Like I said, I'm gonna do this up and do another one to go on the other side. And then I'm gonna take some monofilament and have it where it's like top and bottom. And then see if Mr. Arnold can make something that it can spin in mm -hmm. or something like that with a piece of turquoise from the mine. And it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's- Gonna give, give Mr. Arnold a challenge. That's it, just see what he can do. I imagine he'll be call he'll be texting in here in a minute just he's already got some ideas. He's up in Vegas today and not sure what he's up to there. Well he's been in the shop. In fact, I hope he's sporting around one of my wood salary hats that he got. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Then, but you take it and do this, and this is like I said, this is stamping. When you're doing carving like or tooling like this, man, that's intricate work there. That's beautiful workmanship, though. And that's where you use your swivel knife a lot more, and you do a lot of different tools, um, things like that. And I built that about ten years ago. Just to, yeah, look at that. It's just amazing workmanship mm -hmm. right there. Well, like I said, it's just something that, and everything's different. That's one thing you gotta, you gotta emphasize. I couldn't do this exactly the same on anything. 
Everything is unique, as unique as the individual that orders it or buys it or things like that. It might look the same. You might be able to, you know, get close, but I can't control how much depth I get. It depends on the leather too, because each cow is an individual and where the hide comes from. And so, you know, it's everything's different. You, a cow hide, when you get it, you look, it'll have blemishes. It comes from different bug bites, brands, things like that on the side. And it is just, you never know. And there's several different kinds of leather too. A lot of people don't know. Napa, California was famous a hundred years before they ever planted the first grapevine. Napa Valley, Napa Valley, California had at one time nine tanneries going. And the way you tan leather, the vegetable tan leather, which was what they started out doing, is where you boil the barks of different trees to make the tanning liqueurs that you mix in pits, and then you suspend the hides and you have a machine, you know, basically just weighs it. And it takes a month to tan a hide. Well, Napa used a combination of different tree barks that made the leather some of the softest leather in the world at the time, and it was being shipped all over the world back in the 1840s. And that's, if you've ever heard of Napa leather, that's where it was invented and came from. Not to be confused with Corinthian leather, huh? Corinthian leather's Italian. They use a different thing. The leather I use, I use nothing but 100% American leather. And my two tanneries that I get from are Herman Oak out of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, they've been tanning for about 180 years. And Wicket and Craig, which comes out of Pennsylvania. Of course, Herman Oak uses more oak tannins to tan their hides. Wicket and Craig use a lot more hemlock and other native trees in that area to make the liqueurs. Vegetable tan leather is the only leather you can tool. It's the only one that absorbs enough moisture and the I put a special soap in there too to make it easier to tool and get more depth. But 90% of the leather that you buy in boots, you know, furniture, things like that, is what's called chromium tan leather. In the 1850s, they learned that chromium salts could tan a hide in 24 hours. All right, so of course that's more efficient and things like that. And so the biggest tannery in the United States is Maine. Apparently they have a lot of chromium salts up there and that's where most of the leather gets tanned in the United States. You know, when you go to restore a saddle, mm -hmm. how do you, I mean, obviously you don't want to go splicing new leather into this. No. It's just not going to work. But how do you, I mean, do you restore the flexibility of the leather Absolutely. as well? Yeah. That's the main thing. And around here, it's very difficult. That, that's the most difficult thing because of our dry humidity, no humidity, you know, extreme dry weather and things, leather will dry out. It is a natural product. It is the height of an animal. I mean, because you can get leather at all different kinds. Bringing back the supple, this saddle here, when I first got it, you could not do this. It would break. And we use, of course, water. Main thing is to get the moisture back in as fast as you can. And so you use a purified water in there to bring back the fibers. Then you start putting, um, I use only two different kinds of products for that. And that's uh, pure neat's foot oil and I make, much my grandfather's recipe, we call it saddle grease. And we make it up, it's 100% natural, it has beeswax. And so when you apply it and let the leather sit and start absorbing it, the beeswax, all the other oils soak into the leather, but then the beeswax puts a coating on the outside which seals the leather, helps hold that moisture into the leather. Um, makes it waterproof, things like that. Uh, uh, but wax, if you put it on your boots, it's great. It waterproof fire your boots. But as soon as you move, the wax cracks. And so that'll let moisture in. But you have to do that. That's the main thing about restoration is getting the leather back to a supple quality. I mean, you could not do this at all. It'd break right in half. But when we did uh, Andy Devine style, they did what a lot of people do. They used a petroleum-based product on it. Petroleum breaks down leather fibers, and that's what makes the leather not last as long as it does. And it also leaves a lot of residue. I had to take in all the tooling, take a toothpick, toothpick and a toothbrush, and clean out all the tooling from all the buildup of different products they'd used to clean the saddle over the years. Wow. It took three weeks. 
and that's not counting polishing the silver. I always felt sorry for the horse <laughs> that, that, that carried that saddle well, with, with Andy Devine in it. Andy Devine never rode much. You know, he wasn't. Uh, when he got that saddle and thing, that was just a parade saddle. In other words, he rode the length of the parade and took breaks in between. Um, he was not, in his younger days, I'm sure he's quite the horseman. As he got larger, then it was just a show thing, mainly. To, now, he had horses, and from what I understand, he had a very nice horse farm in, there in California and things, and raised a lot of good horses. But he was beyond the age of getting out there, roping and breaking and riding them and things like that. But he was a large man, and it took a big horse to carry him. Yeah, that's, like I say, I always felt sorry for the ponies because <laughs> why? Because he was a big fella, and that saddle is not. What does that saddle weigh by chance? That saddle, I actually weighed it. It weighs about forty-eight pounds, yeah. and well, twenty-three bad. pounds of it is silver. And but it is an eighteen inch, and the way you measure a saddle seat on Western, you measure from right here to right here. This is a thirteen inch. Mine's a fifteen inch. All right, his is an eighteen inch. So you figure using this saddle as an example, that you can see is thirteen inches. That's how the seat, how much bigger the seat is on his saddle. Now, when you do that, you have to extend the bars and things like that. So it's a big saddle, a very big saddle. It's not as heavy as I thought it was then. Well, it, just, they, it looks heavier. It looks heavy, and the Tapaderos actually put a lot, of, I didn't weigh it with Tapaderos on. Tapaderos are very heavy too, uh, because they have a lot of silver and things like that. Um, but like I said, that was just, that wasn't an all day riding saddle. That was <laughs> ceremonial. <laughs> very ceremonial, very ceremonial. But it's an extremely well-built saddle. Like I told the story about the gentleman that made the saddle. He made excellent, excellent saddles. You know, stories like that aren't told often enough. No. About that saddle maker. That's, it, so many of those people have slipped through the cracks. Well, it, they, not, it, it's just, you know, the United States is a country of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And it's not that they are looking to be famous or stuff like that. They just have the liberty to be the best they can be on anything. And that's what makes it different from any place else in the world. Well, that's one reason I started doing these programs is because so many people have fallen through the cracks. I like to show off the craftsmen, the artisans that are still keeping the traditions alive that oh, are doing Thank things. You. It's a lot of fun. And, of course, you meet some great people. Uh, this town is full of colorful and some characters. Uh, <laughs> and that's what makes it interesting. We used to call them dry-roasted nuts. But that's another story. Oh, back home they'd say, yeah, oh, yeah. And he, he's a little touched in the head. Uh, and things like that. And then there were some of them we just absolutely called screwballs. You know, they were just way out there and stuff. But this town has got everything, and that's the beauty part about it. I mean, you were able to meet somebody, talk to somebody at the store that's from Boston, just moved here from Boston, Canada, um, and of course the South, and all through the Midwest and things like that, and they all come into Kingman. They love the weather. They love all the different things around here. It's quite a diversity. It's a lot of fun, and just listening to their stories is a lot of fun. And the Route 66 element adds uh, some real interesting touches to the people. Oh, absolutely. Going through here. I just, uh, we had one gentleman that came through recently, uh, 79 years old, and he just decided he wanted to walk Route 66 from Chicago to California. Wow, that's neat. And uh, we had another fellow, Rashid Huda, last year that did that and uh, started out in July, finished it up in uh, January. And, you just meet the most interesting well, people. And I've had people that come in, of course, they're here for the Route 66, to be on Route 66, which is just ultimately so cool. And they walk in because they've never seen a saddle shop. I've had people from Sweden. I've had people from Austria, France, Belgium, uh, Italy, uh, UK, Australia. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, sold a, a lady and a gentleman um, a saddle that I'm going to be shipping to Australia. Um, you just see them from everywhere, and it's fun. They come in, they want, I let them sit on the saddles, do what they want to, take pictures of themselves on the saddles and things like that. It's just a lot of fun. I mean, you meet some great people. And it's just the Route 66, listening to them talk about 
60, Route 66, the capability of going almost 2,000 miles without having to show any papers, a passport, anything else, which you can't do in Europe. You've been to Europe. I've been to Europe. I mean, you carry your passport like you carry your driver's license. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so it's it's pretty neat. It is very, very neat. And here they come to, into Kingman to ride the, you know, to get on the longest stretch of Route 66. And when we moved here in 2012, it hasn't, it, it's grown since then. Um, one of the first things we did when we moved in this area was go to Grand Canyon uh, Caverns which was awesome. I mean, that was, my kids loved it. And they do have good food. Well, he's changed that a bit now. He's got a, a little restaurant down in the caverns. I, they had the hotel room down there when I first went in there. Now he's got a little lunch room down there. There we go. In the caverns. And he's got a lady that comes in uh, three, four times a week and makes pies now. That's oh, just extraordinary. I'm pie. sorry. That pies and ice cream are my weakness. Uh, mm -hmm. just, uh, it's, mm -hmm. I, it's, ice cream is one of those things the doctor says, you know, Tim, you shouldn't eat that much ice cream. I'm like, no. <laughs> Come up, use your brain, think of something else, because I'm not going to stop eating my ice cream. That's just not going to happen. You know, that's... <laughs> you know, speaking of this, uh, we touched on this before with uh, the caverns, something we should discuss sometime. John's re restored, uh, redone the entire rodeo grounds up there. The, mm -hmm. the, the bleachers, the grandstands, everything's all done. And he's looking to do events and things up there. And so well, I tell you what, the amount of people that have horses that are doing events, competing, is tremendous. I mean, that is, and not just Western. We're talking about English, dressage, hunter jumper is growing by leaps and bounds. There are breeds, I've been in the horse business my entire life. And there are breeds that when I moved here and opened the South Shop that I had never heard of. Um, magnificent horses. I mean, there is some the most beautiful horses you've seen in the world, and I didn't even know they existed. And it is just amazing. And the and these riding clubs, there's I bet there's over a hundred different riding clubs in this area. Uh, different breeds, whether it be Arabian, Appaloosa, Quarter Horse, Paint Horse. Um, everything, uh, the Normans, uh, the Gypsies, uh, all these are descendants of horses and European horses. The Gypsies were actually descendants of the draft horses and the horses they rode that pulled their Gypsy wagons all over Eastern Europe and things like that. And they are, they've got a feathered out leg like Clydesdales, but they're only about this tall and they they're very athletic they're just just beautiful well tim god bless thank you for doing this this morning oh, Taking time and thanks for the coffee but <laughs> but this uh, this has been good this is this is why i do this is people need to be aware of some of the things we have here in kingman mm -hmm. and the great craftsmen and artisans that we have here well, thank you Jim. appreciate it there is one cell i'd like you to look at before you leave before we leave it's right over here this is an arizona made sound made by Porter Saddle Company in Phoenix, Arizona. This saddle um, actually stayed in a lady's uh, living room from the early 70s. Mr. Porter moved from his saddle shop in Abilene, Texas, burnt down, and he moved to Phoenix in the 1880s. And he was considered the best saddle maker in the United States. And he had some of the best saddle makers in the United States working for him. And they closed down in 1967, I believe. I might be wrong. But they made some of the best saddles. And you talk to the old timers, ranchers, and things like that around here, you didn't have a saddle unless you had a porter. They were indestructible. The craftsmanship is just amazing. This saddle was probably built in the late 40s. Very, very good. And, of course, we couldn't finish up this morning without showing off your Christmas tree, huh? <laughs> Well, Tim, that, that is a one of a kind. It is one of a kind. There's no one. Up, my wife has been looking. There are no, there's not a Christmas tree made out of saddles anywhere in the United States. And it took seven saddles to build it. And like I said, there's no way I can compete with the ladies and their art skills uh, downtown. I mean, you take some of the, the you know, the farmhouse and the, you know, all the different arts and crafts that they do, the Kingman Center for Arts and things, I couldn't compete with that. There's just no way. So I sort of went opposite, and me and my sons got in here, built the frame, and we started stacking saddles, and we sort of went low-tech, and that's what you got right there. 
Very good. And of course, you're a drop off for Toys for Tots. Absolutely, absolutely. One of the very few uh, charities where 100% of what you donate gets to the kids for Christmas. Um, all the toys around here come out of the box. I'd like to fill the box several times. Um, just it, It's just a good thing to have. And, and um, my family and I have been involved with it for about 20 years now. But not only saddles. We make all kinds of stuff. The caps. Uh, if you also look, um, started making, we started making several years ago Christmas stockings out of leather. Um, we make a lot of custom holsters. Um, in fact, a lot of holsters. We make a lot and just all kinds of different things. Anything out of leather, I can usually make it. Do you have a website, Tim? Or don't have a website? Do have a Facebook page? We're gonna have to fix that for you. <laughs> and we, we, we just happen to have a fellow here from my marketing designs that can sure take care of that for you. Well, that's good. That's right. That's right. God bless. Thank you very much, Tim. Well, thank for being you, Jim. Morning. I appreciate it. You betcha. This has been. You won't buy any time. This has been good, real good. Thank you. I don't know. Bye-bye, folks. We'll see you next week. We want to thank uh, Joe and the Road Crew for that theme song.